become less of just baby-making machines and more like people who fully participate in the economy. So the first major factor is the status of women. And with the rise in the status of women in some parts of the world, by no means all, with the rise in the status of women, you find that, in fact, women go out to work, they regard baby-making as only one of the things that they do, and there are already very substantial changes. The degree, you know, I don't know whether you know the figures, but as far as I remember, the, the world population is increasing by something like 84 million people a year who weren't there before. It's already dropping quite substantially. And the, where it drops most substantially is where women are beginning to play a much rather different role in society. We can all think of areas where it is not the case, but it's nonetheless the case. So where women have equal status with men, they can inherit land, they can, they can um, go out and do jobs, they're not just pe <coughs> people who manufacture babies, you find that change taking place. The second thing is when people in old age don't feel they rely upon their grandchildren to look after them, but you have proper welfare arrangements. Again, that removes one of the inducements to increase population. Then you've got to have, obviously, you've got to think about the availability of contraceptive devices and willing, willingness to use them, where again, you come up against the Pope and maybe one or two other people as well. But nonetheless, I think that it's rather interesting to tell that the two most Catholic countries in Europe is the countries where population is diminishing fastest at the moment. It's quite a significant point. I gather from my informants that w people no longer confess to using these things when they get into the, into the confessional, <laughs> which is quite a quite interesting change in itself. And finally, it's the education point. With girls should be edu educated in the same way as boys, and they should be, that's part of the process of giving them equal status. And I think all that should happen. So you bring all these things together, you find that in certain parts of the world, including this country, population is in fact going down. And the only reason it's going up is of increased immigration, which, as I said, was the big, is, the, is the tail end of the population problem. It's true that population, that the rate of fertility is also diminishing in Europe is continuing to rise in Africa. In uh, China, it's going down quite drastically because the Chinese have recognized the problem and done something about it. They have their one child, one, one child, one, child, one family uh, policy. All these things create enormous difficulties. And if there's any interest to you, I was asked by the BBC yesterday if I would talk about this as a possible election issue. I frankly don't think it could possibly be an election <laughs> issue. <laughs> but I also think that it's a very important issue. And I think that... Uh, between 19, in, in the year 1970s, when Paul Ehrlich wrote his famous book about the population bomb, everyone talks about it. Then they went into a period in which people scratched themselves and said they prefer not to talk about it. Now it's coming back. And I do finally r r commend to you a very interesting book by the same person, <coughs> Paul and Anne Ehrlich, husband and wife, a very interesting book called The Dominant Animal, which shows the extent to which humans now, as the dominant animal, are changing the face of the earth. Um, cultural CPR is dead. There's been no mention uh, to speak of, of um, the water supply. Um, hence is one of the driest parts of the UK at present. Um, in, in recent years, we've had quite acute water shortages. Um, how does this relate to the uh, energy supply which we talked about? Well, I did say that we would, in the future, we would look to warmer and uh, drier summers and possibly warmer and wetter winters. So water is absolutely critical to the whole thing. One of the, one of the predictions that people make about future climate is that water is going to be in shorter supply in the, su in, in the south. Um, again, we don't know. But um, what the, when I talked about climate destabilization, I mean, in many ways, variations in the patterns of rainfall. It's quite interesting, for example, to take one particular example, is that the warming of the Indian Ocean has affected the character of the monsoon in East Africa, which is why Kenya has been suffering quite substantial droughts and also Zimbabwe um, and Tanzania, but <coughs> they, they hadn't happened before. You find comparable circumstances arising in south e south w uh, southeastern Australia, where they've had terrible droughts, which are almost certainly linked to changes in, in, in climate. So you've got all these different things happening. In the case of Kent, I don't know to what extent you're dependent on hydroelectricity, but I would think it to be a very uncertain source of supply of energy. What I would simply say is that you, we are going to have to make much better use of water. If I, were, if I were king, as you might say, 
I would want very much to take sp new steps to preserve water in the same way we would have to take new steps to do our drainage systems because a lot of drainage systems are very out of date and the reservoirs are in the wrong place. It's very interesting to see that London at the moment is absolutely covered with, with roadworks because people are in fact trying to restore the, 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 the Victorian drainage and water systems. That may well be necessary in other parts of the country, in particular in Kent, because you are vulnerable. My main point is that you're vulnerable, and that does relate very much to water supplies and the uses we make of water. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, as you will gather from what I said, the answer is no. <laughs> Economic growth, you have to decide what you mean by it. Uh, if you mean trying to increase productivity within certain limits, that's fine. But if, you, if I can just take the, I think to use it as the measuring device for deciding whether a society is healthy or not is a great mistake, because it, it doesn't tell you about health. It tells you, uh, it tells you about uh, how much you produce. And for that reason, I think it's a very unwise form of measurement. And I think that uh, Keynes, who is frequently accredited with having introduced this idea, would himself have been highly critical about the emphasis on growth that has been placed. But when you come to look at growth, we've got to somehow look, for example, let me just take one example in agriculture. If you try to use uh, industrial agriculture,